Welcome to your weekly UAS news update. This is the week of December 7, 2020. I've got four topics, and then the last topic actually is gonna be a pretty long video. I'm doing an interview, so I want you to stay until the end and make sure that you watch that part. A lot of really interesting uh, information in there. But the first thing I wanna talk about this week is, if you remember, we've been talking about the, the Chinese drone tech ban that was gonna be in this, uh, this document called the National Defense Authorization Act. Well, that was rejected. So we're gonna talk about what happened and then kind of what it means. We're gonna talk about a group in Texas that is moving forward with a lawsuit or that is allowed to move forward with a lawsuit to overturn some pretty drastic Texas drone laws. Speaking of Texas, we're gonna talk about a state Senate in Texas uh, candidate that is uh, caught on camera, well, not caught on camera, it is one of their ad where they're shooting a drone in the ad and we'll talk about what, uh, what that means and then what uh, kind of regulation they could have been broken here. And then lastly, I wanna talk about the Drone Service Provider Alliance, which is the DSPA, and why you should be a part of it and why it is important for this industry. So let's get started. All right, the first thing this week is this drone tech ban, this Chinese drone tech ban that was supposed to go into the National Defense Authorization Act, the NDAA. And there was, a, there was two different versions of the bill, of the, the act. There was a House version and then a, there was a Senate version. The House version actually had the ban in the, uh, in the act. And, and what the ban is, is we've been talking about this, if you've been following for a while, we've been talking about this uh, for several years now, it feels like, uh, where uh, the uh, the government would not allow uh, U.S. federal agencies to use or to purchase Chinese drones to use within the agency, and uh, and this could have some drastic effect for companies like DJI, for example. Now, the Senate version did not have the ban, so there was kind of a discrepancy between the Senate and the House, and uh, and so the the. The, the ban for the Chinese drone tech has been removed from the, from the act at the moment. So this is a big win for DJI uh, that has been, I know, uh, trying to push for this to not happen. And, uh, and so that's kind of where we are at the moment. So um, I'm still, quite frankly, a little bit confused as to uh, what happens if the government is, or if, if, um, if federal agencies are now allowed to use the drone because uh, we know, I reported a while back, that they were basically banned from using them already, even though this act hadn't been put in place. So um, maybe somebody that has a bit more information about this, I uh, apologize, I should probably be a little bit clearer about this part, but uh, but this is, this is what we've seen in the news this week. The next thing also has to do, to do with law. This is a group in Texas that is trying to overturn a, a very strict Texas law. And we've talked about this before. Uh, Texas has some very interesting laws regarding uh, the use of drones and what you can and can't photograph. And uh, especially for journalists and, and journalists, uh, had a, a case a while back basically saying that this uh, infringes on their right to do their job. And, uh, and so this group has uh, come up with a lawsuit and they were allowed to move to the next level to try to overturn this Texas law. So uh, at this stage, it's kind of the information that I have or that I have seen, but I would like to uh, follow up on this because I know there's gonna be more information in the future. And this is kind of important. Uh, if for those of you that fly in Texas, you know how restrictive the law is there. And and how different it is from other states uh, around the country. So uh, something that's kind of a, an important step right here. Speaking of Texas, uh, there's a state candidate, and uh, and I don't even know if I want to mention her name, but her name is Shelly Luther. And uh, Shelly is seen in a video uh, shooting at a drone. It looks like it's a DJI uh, Tello, $120 Tello. And her her post brought a lot of comments, and a lot of comments from the, the drone industry, actually. A lot of people went on there to make comments, which, by the way, were very quickly deleted. Uh, they've been censoring anybody that doesn't agree with what is in the ad, uh, which is which is kind of sad, uh, but a lot of people have been reminding her that it is a felony to shoot at a drone under the 18 U.S. Code 32, and uh, and that's punishable by uh, imprisonment and then a, a, I think it's a ten thousand dollar fine. Um, she defended herself in one of the comments, and you can see the comment right here, basically saying that it was okay because it was her drone and she was actually flying it, which. 
It kind of brings me to the video from last week. Uh, by the way, the video from last week brought uh, a bazillion comments and I tried to reply as to as many as I could. I may have missed some, but there were amazing discussions. And I think a lot of you realize a lot of things and learn from this video, which is awesome, which is exactly the reason why I published the video was to try to educate uh, everyone out there. But to go back to that video, you know, we talked about what is the difference between flying under 44809, which is the, uh, the exception for a recreational flying and flying under part 107. And, um, and this, is a, this is the perfect example right here of this person that's basically saying, hey, I can do whatever I want. I, that was my own drone. Now, in this case, let's think about this for a second, okay? What is the intent of the flight? A lot of you have asked questions about the intent of the flight, which is what I mentioned in the video. And, um, and by the way, some of you said, well, I'm posting on, on, YouTube, on, on YouTube or whatever it is, I should be allowed to do it. And yes, you are, by the way. This is a big clarification if you are recording for recreational purposes and putting this on your YouTube channel, which is for recreational purposes, then nobody's gonna give you trouble, okay? I wanted to make that clear. The, the fact that you're putting your footage on YouTube does not necessarily mean that it is part 107. I wanna keep that very clear. There's a lot more things that come into play to make that decision. But with that being said, let's look at this person right here using this this is obviously a staged video, and uh, not only a staged video, but it's also going onto a politi political uh, webpage on Facebook. Right there, this disqualifies this person from operating under 44809, which means what? If you remember the video from last week, this means that they're now operating under Part 107. So if somebody was to look into this and say, well, this person is not Part 107 certified, she said in her comment right here that she was flying the drone, and uh, not only that, but now she's saying that she was the remote pilot in command, so she needs to have a Part 107 certificate, and she needs to be in control of the drone at all time. And 18 U.S. Code 32, you can shoot at a drone, so, well, you do the math. So uh, I thought this was really interesting because this is kind of a, a direct um, application to what we talked about last week. And uh, again, just, well... I'm not gonna give you my, uh, my personal opinion on this. I wanna keep this as neutral as I can, but this is what we saw today. This actually happened today, uh, right before I started recording this video. Last thing I wanna talk about, something that's actually really serious and something that actually I'm really excited about. Uh, the drone industry has needed some representation for a long time. And when I say the drone industry, I'm talking about drone service providers. Drone service providers is, is you that has a drone, does this for a job, you only have one person flying the drone, or maybe you have one or two employees, you're a small business, and you use drones in your small business. And at the moment, there is really no representation for you because, well, because there's 200,000 remote pilots in the country, and uh, there's not a voice to uh, to go to the local lawmakers, to the, the federal lawmakers, with the FAA and with other agencies. So um, introducing the Drone Service Provider Alliance, and uh, this just started last week, and there's two people at the head of the, uh, the DSPA, and that's Kenji Sugohara, and that's Vic Moss. And Vic and Kenji are uh, powerhouses behind the drone industry. They've been doing this for a really long time. They've been very vocal about this. Uh, if you're part of any forums, I'm sure you've seen one of the two uh, talking about different issues. So. They're great representatives of the industry and they've decided to create this uh, alliance. And this is something that you can be a part of. So what I did is I sat down with them this morning. We recorded about a 30 minute interview and, uh, and I want you to take a look at this. So uh, without further ado, they will explain everything, why you should be a part of it, uh, what's in it for you. And uh, let's watch the footage and then we'll be done for this week. So I will see you guys next week after this video. Welcome to another awesome interview and this week actually we are joined by Kenji and Vic and I'll, I'll give you the quick introduction in a second but um, they are the two founding members for the, the new company or new alliance I should say called the Drone Service Providers Alliance, the DSPA. And, uh, and this is something that has been in the works for a while and I want to talk to both of them. Uh, they have been uh, industry titans, if I can call them that way. Uh, they have uh, a, a lot of reach and, and a lot of experience in this industry. So Kenji, Vic, welcome on board. Thank you. Thank you. 
So Kenji wears a lot of different hats in the UAS industry. He's the co-owner and he has been the co-owner and the chief pilot for ACAM Aerial for seven years. He's based in Salem, Oregon and uh, works with very large clients, Netflix, HBO, Hulu, Warner Brothers, just to name a few. And uh, if you want to see some cool footage, go on uh, Kenji's website. Some really, really cool stuff. Uh, he's also a recognized expert in uh, on remote ID. We've actually talked to him last year, if you remember, if you've been following us for a while. In February, we had an interview with him talking about the NPRM for Remote ID. Uh, I'm sure he's going to have a lot to talk about in a few weeks when uh, the FAA finally releases all of this uh, good stuff with Remote ID. Uh, he's been part of the ARC, the Aviation Rulemaking Committee, since 2017 and has been helping the FAA with Remote ID. Uh, he's also a member of ASTM. If you're not familiar with ASTM, they create standards for pretty much anything in the world, but he's been working with them for Remote Mode ID standards. And um, he's now the president and the CEO of Drone Service Provider Alliance. So Kenji, welcome on board. Thank you. And then uh, Vic. Vic is also extremely involved with the industry. If you're on any Facebook forums with, uh, with drones that are in there, you'll see Vic uh, making comments all the time. And uh, Vic is the owner of Moss Photography. He's based in Denver, Colorado. And he's been doing this for a long time. He actually started flying when I was just a little kid, 32 years ago. <laughs> <Ouch>. <laughs> <laughs> and no, uh, I started flying six years ago. That's right. That's right. He's been flying for six years. And uh, he's the director of legislative affairs for UAS Colorado, where he actually works with local uh, municipalities and governments to help them create regulation, that drone regulation, that actually makes sense. And uh, he's also a drone pro with the FAA FAST team uh, for the Denver uh, FISDO. The, the, he's basically helping others understand how drones work and, and how the regulation work and helping the FAA spread the word. So, uh, Vic, thank you for doing all of that good stuff. Sure thing. This is probably where I should put my disclaimer that, that everything I say it does not represent the opinions of the FAA. <laughs> That's so right. <laughs> make sure that we get that out there. Um, so I keep my friends at the FAA happy. <laughs> That's right. Um, so my first question is many industry, many in the industry have asked that uh, there is a voice for drone service providers uh, with the, the various lawmakers out there uh, talking about the FAA, local government, federal government. So what gave you the idea to start DSPA? Well, uh, to, to be honest, what it was, was we saw there was a hole in the, in the industry in terms of representation for small and medium-sized businesses. With, there's the large larges are very well represented and you have the commercial drone alliance and other entities that are there but there really hasn't been an effective sort of organization uh, from our perspective uh, to represent our interests because we fly for our jobs and our livelihood so we have a set of concerns that are going to be different than sort of the media or the large sized entities so Vic and I uh, sort of got together and I, I, I had to convince Vic uh, to actually come on board and start this because uh, he really was, did not want to get involved in, there were some issues, but uh, eventually I was able to convince him, hey, uh, this is what we already do. We have a connection base that is so deep uh, within the community and at the regulatory agencies and at sort of the standards groups why don't we do something? Because we've sort of been doing this for free. And it, I, I, this is an opportunity to really professionalize and increase our influence mm -hmm. to help create legislate, uh, policies that are uh, friendly to us as operators. Because we know what the day-to-day -day operator goes through. Uh, not only at the federal level, but also at the, the state level and local level. And we've done uh, sort of advocacy at all those levels. Yep. Yeah, and there's yeah I, would, I would definitely, that's perfect to what he was saying, um, or what Kenji was saying. And yeah, he, I was kind of not interested in getting involved in something I kind of wanted to my own time uh, back after I got out of uh, where I was before. And so it didn't take real long. I think maybe a day it's, I got back to you and said, okay, let's do this. And you're right. Yeah. We were doing this already anyway. So, you know, we're, we're a volunteer organization. It's not like Kenji and I are, are going to take a salary on this thing right now. Um, but yeah, so it, it, I just, he, he, he convinced me with what basically what he just said, he convinced me. 
Well, I'm glad. I, as soon as I saw the announcement, actually, I saw your logo changing on your profile, Vic, and I was like, "Oh, wait, is that Vic?" And then, uh, and then I, I saw, and then I started looking a little bit more, and I was like, "This is perfect. You guys are the two perfect people to do this in the industry." So, uh, you. you know, interestingly, the, the representation, if you look at it now, and I know a lot of people have been kind of uh, criticizing this, but a lot of the people that are making the regulation changes and uh, and creating a new regulation are not really pilots they're, they're they, they've probably never even flown a drone for some of them and uh so now we have representation hopefully out there uh with people that do this for a living um so tell me in a few words or in a lot of words what are the goals for dspa what do you plan on doing well i think you know uh, kenji you know kenji put it best on the website it's basically unified voice for change that we want to be able to get the small and medium-sized operators voice heard um, we can all get together and we can do things like when our ID came out, a lot of us got together and really unified and, and, and put the comments in. And, and most of them were very intelligent comments uh, in, in the NPRM. And so that was great, but then that was it. That was, that was you know, of course, everybody's going to get together and do that. Um, but we wanted to be able, like what Kenji said, is we want to have the power behind it and the force behind it. And where it's not just a bunch of individuals talking, it's, a, it's an organization that does represent them. Uh, in the best interest of the small and medium or uh, medium sized uh, companies, definitely. Yep. Kenji, no? Yeah, I, I agree 100%. Uh, one, of my, one of my favorite PowerPoints, uh, unfortunately, I don't, uh, we, we can't present it, uh, that was uh, created by one of my friends. It shows a bunch of arrows going in all di different directions. And our job is really to get those uh, arrows headed in one direction. And uh, that, as a community, is much more effective than just doing one-offs, somebody just writing one letter. When you have the power of voices, it makes a difference. And uh, for us, that, that's our main goal. I, I know there's a lot of different verticals, but there's, uh, there's a lot of commonalities between. Some issues might not be applicable to some folks, but again, there's, there's ways to make sure that we cover everybody's bases uh, and help out those people in those specific verticals too. So it's, uh, there's, there's ways of doing things, uh, especially on the policy level, that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's going to impact everybody. So you, you just brought me to my next question, actually. You know, you said everybody's going kind of in a different direction because everybody's kind of shooting their own arrow. Um, there's, I just checked yesterday, there's over 200,000 certified remote pilots now uh, on the FAA website. How are you going to find the direction that people want to go? Because this is going to be challenging to, it's like herding 200,000 cats uh, in the same direction. How do you plan on doing this? How do you plan on gathering information from the people that you're going to represent? Victor? Oh, golly, sure, why not? Um, it, it's... Well, we already have, we're already gathering it already anyway. All you do is spend a day on the forums and you can understand the need. Um, but, you know, just having them write in, uh, you know, Kenji and I are both easily accessible on the website. Uh, webs our email addresses are right there. And um, getting the input from them is, is vitally important, um, as well as um, we're going to have a uh, pretty robust um, advisory council. Um, We've had people say yes. We're kind of, we're still trying to get get uh, you know get a final job description for them and sent out um, for an official invite, which we will announce here pretty soon. Um, but you know, being transparent as well is going to be really huge uh, for us. Kenji and I talked about that a lot. Where we want we want to know, you know, we want everybody to know what we're doing and and how we can help them and and transparent, not only going out, but coming in as well, where we want the information and we want the input from anybody and everybody um, in the industry. Absolutely. Uh, but really those small, those small operators um, and the medium sized operators as well that just don't have the voice. Yep. Yeah. And I think this and, is, and, and, and Vic hits that nail on the head. Open communication is absolutely critical and making sure that everybody is heard uh, and, and appreciated and understood. Um, and there's, there's going to be some common themes, I think, that come out through that, the, that sort of communication uh, across industry sectors. And that's sort of how we will be able to figure out what sort of where we should put our, put our priorities. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I see this a lot because a lot of our students are going into this and, and they're starting like everybody else started with a one man operation and, uh, and they're going to be faced with the same challenges, I think. So mm -hmm. that's, that's a good thing. Um, many have tried in the past and many have failed to try to do this kind of alliance. What have you learned from what the others have done? If you've kind of studied what they did or why do you think this wasn't successful in the past? I have my own ideas and, and I'm sure you may have the same ideas, but tell me what you think. Gosh, um, I'm not sure the industry was ready for it to be quite honest. Yeah. You had Serpa, which was, you know, had some great people in leadership. Um, but I don't think the industry was quite ready to, to coalesce behind somebody, uh, and I, and I honestly believe that remote ID was the catalyst for a lot of this. It's like, oh my goodness, you know, we, we, we don't have a voice, you know, and, and the issues with the DAC um, where we're not represented. It's, I think between those two, it, it's kind of, I don't want to say woken up the industry because, you know, we all felt the same thing, but it was just kind of like this, this cohesive catalyst that said, okay, now's the time. We hope we're successful. Maybe we'll fail too. I don't know, but I really hope not. I don't think we will. I don't think we will. I don't think you will either. Yeah. And from my perspective, uh, as, as Vic said, remote ID was a catalyst, but there's also other things too. Uh, not only at the federal level, for example, the Uniform Law Commission, uh, some of the ideas that came out through that, they, they are not going away. Yeah. So there are going to be major policy fights over quote unquote airship ownership and sort of regu regulation too. So those are critical things that need to be addressed. And we need to make sure that uh, our voices are heard, especially before state legislatures and, and, and city councils and, and you name it, because every time uh, an ordinance goes out or a state statute goes out that sort of puts restrictions on what we do, it makes all our jobs that much more difficult. Yep. Because what the, what, what'll happen is uh, other uh, jurisdictions will take notice and say, oh, I'm going to try to do that too. So we need to make sure we're not nipping these in the bud. And I, I think having sort of the connections that we have and sort of the toolkits that we've developed, we can help uh, pilots sort of counter, counter those issues and so, also just get involved. So you, you mentioned a bunch of key terms here, a local regulation, obviously. I actually forgot about the ULC because I think they've been kind of quiet too. for a while. <laughs> and uh, we talked about, I talked about this a lot when, when this was going on. But ULC, obviously remote ID, uh, local regulation, trying to, to prevent local um, uh, regulators from, from doing things that they're not supposed to be doing and that's not overly restrictive mm -hmm. which one of these issues do you think is at the top of your list right now or maybe you're tackling all of these i don't know mm. i'd say at this point it, it probably will be more the national stuff um the ndaa uh, was a great uh, great example of that when the uh, uh, conference committee did not include the uh the or uh was it country of origin ban or whatever it's called. That was good. There's still some things out there that, that may, may do that. But, but those type of things, and I think really what our focus is going to be, um, hopefully I'm not speaking out of turn here, Kenji, because we haven't talked about this. <laughs> um, <laughs> once, once we see remote ID, um, there is going to be, oh my gosh, so much education. You know, and if it's, if it's, if it's anything like the NPRM, there's going to be a lot more than just education that goes involved. Yep. Um, if cooler heads in the FAA and, and more importantly, the security agencies prevailed, then it, it will probably be, probably be more of an education type thing, but still making sure that we, do, we, we don't destroy the industry with it. Um, we can't let that happen. So I think at this point, it's probably going to be a little more national, but definitely reach out. We've got, we've got a local, um, you know, how to handle a local local ordinance issue already on the site mm -hmm. uh, paper mm -hmm. on that so it that, that that brings up a good point Vic in, in terms of the FAA we are not sort of antagonists with the FAA mm -hmm. and, and Vic mm -hmm. and I have always said we we want to work with the FAA uh, we won't rubber stamp everything we won't agree on everything but we will give constructive feedback and uh, uh, our expectation is that uh, our, our, our opinion will be valued and taken into consideration. Um, and the, 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 the idea that the FAA's big, bad or, uh, agency is, is, not, is not in our DNA. We're not no. going to be afraid to call them out for what we disagree with, but it won't be nasty. It'll be, how can we help you improve? Because I think 
all the the folks the FA have have uh, their best the best interests in mind. They're they're hoping to balance interests and want to do the right thing. And we want to provide the tool sets of the information and data that they need to make those those decisions. Yeah, and I think that's a great approach. That's a great approach. That, you know, uh, we 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 vilified the FA a lot as a, as an entity, but at the end of the day, the um, the, the people that work there are not anti-drone, especially the people that work mm-hmm. in the drone department. They they want us to be safe. They want us to uh, follow the regulation that is in place right now. And we may not always agree with the regulation, but we have to live with the FAA. And antagonizing the FAA is not the way to go. We we need to work with them. So I'm, I'm glad that's uh, I'm glad you're saying all this. That's a great stance. Mm-hmm. Um, Vic, a question for you. You have uh, submitted your application to get into the DAC. The DAC is the Drone mm-hmm. Advisory Committee, which is a group of, I don't know how many people there are in there now, but uh, 20, is it? 36. I think it's 36. Oh, but 36. I may be wrong. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's a large yeah, number. I can't remember. Uh, it's yeah, a large exactly. number of uh, people that are composed from the industry, supposedly, but we've all noticed that there is a, a major lack of uh, 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 DSPs represented in the DAC. So you submitted an application to be part of the DAC and did you have any challenges? I know you did, and that's why I'm kind of asking this question, in, in, in getting the application put together. And kind of tell us a little bit more about this process. Um, actually, Kenji and I both applied. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. so if one of us get in, actually, we're both in because you, there's, it's kind of a two-person team when you go. Yeah. Um, as did Zoe. So um, she, you know, she's another DSP that would be really, like, really good on there. But um, the challenges, well, I won't mention one of the challenges, but the challenges were – you know, we're, we're one voice. Um, and Kenji and I both put in there that we're working together on the DSPA, you know, the DSPA. Um, and that was evolving. It, it took longer to evolve than we wanted it to because we both got busy uh, with work, which is, you know, a good thing. But um, getting, I guess, getting to the top of the pile is probably the biggest, um, you know, the biggest hurdle you have to when you're applying for something like that. And um, we're just going to, I don't know, it's, it's, we're just going to have to hope and pray that we get on it. Um, I'm actually a little afraid what's going to happen if we don't have a DSP on the, on the DAC. Um, what's going to happen within the industry? You know, they're going to lose respect for what the DAC does. Yeah. Uh, we certainly have our supporters on the DAC. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. You know, yes, there's big names on there, but you've got a couple on there that are 107 pilots. They don't make a living yep. as a 107 pilot, um, but they do represent our interests. It's just they're not us and um uh we we need somebody on there but the challenges weren't really great with one exception for me um and i think the fact that kenji and i are working together is going to be a huge benefit yeah and i i think that's the critical point is somebody who flies day to day because we can provide that perspective that even if you represent you don't understand exactly what we're what happens like when we're setting up to do a job if we're, we're applying for permits and we're 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 doing all going through the motions that these folks don't do they're 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 sea level execs that have no clue how it, 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 it operates. But with the, the other thing too is we're actively in, in, involved with the DAC as, as is right now too, because we're, mm-hmm. all, uh, we're also involved in the task group. So um, you don't need to be a member of the DAC to, to participate in the, the task groups. Uh, Vic's participated in, so I'm involved in one right now in, in terms of how uh, Amanda aircraft are gonna re- uh, relate to uh, sort of remote ID. So that's what, that's what we're working on right now. Uh, in task group nine. And we're just getting that off the ground. Uh, there's some great folks uh, like Dave Messina from the F- FPV Freedom Coalition that's involved yep. in that. And there's, there's, there's just some very, very smart individuals that sort of are helping drive that, those conversations uh, who aren't necessarily part of the DAC, but are, are well known throughout the FAA and in, in the industry too. Yeah, Dave has been doing a lot of great work. I, I follow what he does with the uh, his organization and He's, he's out there for the FPV community for sure. When do you guys expect mm-hmm. to hear anything back for the deck? <laughs> <laughs> we, we're, we're told by, look, I've been told um, that information should be available by, I don't want to say the January meeting, but that doesn't sound right. Maybe it's the March meeting, whatever the next meeting is. Um, supposedly all that stuff's supposed to be um, um, available. Well, actually, you know, the announced. Um, and I'm just, I'm, I'm seriously afraid of what's going to happen in this industry if there's not a DSP on the, on the deck. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
I'm just hoping. And, and pro- process wise, it, it has to go to DOT, mm-hmm. the, the head of DOT, and that's where the approvals happen happening. And the the other consideration too is, of course, there's a transition coming through. So the, mm-hmm. I don't know how that's going to Im- potentially impact anything, but that that is a consideration. Yeah. We I do know, and actually Kenji told me this on the last the last DAC um, applications were sent in. There were DSP sent at the DOT, um, so it was at the DOT level at the, that uh, they were not chosen. Mm-hmm. So I don't remember were, were the new seats. There were three seats available now. Were the new seats because somebody left, or is it because they opened new seats? I think they were trying to fill empties. Oh, they weren't, they weren't filled in yet. They were in there in the first place, yeah. but nobody ever took them. Okay, that, that kind of makes sense. Or, they, or they've left the committee or whatever. So, it's, you know, it's a transitional, it's a transitional committee, um, sort of. It's not, you know, high turnover. But, yeah, there's definitely turnover in the committee. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, the FAA is about to release remote ID. We mentioned this a couple of times. And then other rules as well, flying over people, flying at night. What's your educated prediction slash utopia? <laughs> <laughs> It's two different things now. Come on. <laughs> um, I'm an optimism by, by, by default or an optimist by default. Um, and I think that cooler heads have, have prevailed. I think the FAA has been able to sit down with the people at the, at, the, at the other alphabet agencies and say, look, if you do this, if you make drone pilots do this, um, you're going to get zilch, zilch for compliance. And without compliance, our ID is dead in the water. Yeah. Um, and so that's my hope. Um, and that's my... I think that's going to happen. I really am. And I hope I'm proven right. Um, but I, that's, that's a guess. You know, whether you say, you know, it's, 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 the predictions are very difficult to make, especially when they're about the future. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's in this case. Yeah. I mean, that's just my hope. Um, I have nothing. I have no inside information. Wish I did. I've yeah. tried. Trust me. I'm sure Kinsey has tried too. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, we've tried. We've tried. I mean, even, 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 the, even the ASTM group is we're, we're waiting to figure it waiting for the rule to come out to to really adjust the standard uh that's 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 the next step so we've been sort of on a, a floating by just waiting and waiting and waiting so uh because the standards will like it, it most likely be referenced in that the final rule um and the 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 other thing too is i, I it's, i'm just crossing my fingers for the fpv folks because I, I've turned into an FPV flyer, and, and I love it. The question is, I hope the the remote ID rule is is reasonable to to, to that court order. And Vic has even picked up FPV. Yeah, you I, you you made me spend almost three thousand dollars, so I'm not. Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> yes. Troy's very happy. <laughs> oh yes, he, Troy is very happy. But yeah, the, the, I I mean that's 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 biggest concern. The other things too, of course, are the uh, daylight waiver. Uh, the night operations. Um, I'm I'm pretty confident that's going to be very uh, reasonable. The the ops over people. I'm a little bit concerned. Uh, I've just heard rumblings that uh, the potential is that it might be a little bit onerous in terms of not everybody will be able to. Well, actually, uh, no parachutes will be able to. The mocks are almost impossible to. Uh, to, to comply with it or achieve. So we'll see what comes out of that. And mocks are me- uh, methods of compliance. So yep. um, uh, uh, again, I, I'd like to be an optimist. I'm hoping that uh, it, it, it'll be a positive outcome because uh, especially if you have mitigations, it should be easy and it should be uh, relatively straightforward and safe to be able to fly uh, over, over uh, people. And, and if they don't work, if the, if the regulations are too onerous, then that's where we could come in and say, look, we agree that safety needs to be first. Okay, it's got to, you know, safety first, last, third, you know, the whole nine yards. Um, but what you're advocating for, or what these rules say, are just unfollowable. So yep. you might as well not have them. You know, we show us how to fly safely. You know, how you want us to fly safely, I should say. I think some of the FAA said, you know, applying for waivers, like the waiver says, go get me a rock. And so you bring a rock back and say, no, not that rock. I yep. want this rock. And so, yep. you know, you, you have this, you know, defined rock and, you know, we'll, we'll get you a rock. So, um, you know, that, that hopefully is if, 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 if the new rules come down and they're just, it's just not workable, then that's where the DSPA can come in and, and work alongside the agencies and say, look, what do you want us to do? And, and that's exactly why we need DSPs on, on those boards to mm-hmm. tell the FAA how it works on the ground, not in theory uh, on paper. Um, 
the, uh, th there's been a lot of complaints about overregulation, new regulation, especially with remote ID that could be overregulating everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and especially with small businesses, uh, for larger businesses, you know, it's going to be probably a lot easier. What's, what's your take on this, on the overregulation thing? And then how do you plan to get your point across uh, with the various agencies? Go for it, Kenji. <laughs> So the, in, in terms of the overregulation, I think the home builders uh, and the man, man, small manufacturers uh, were facing some fairly uh, significant hurdles in the NPRM, and uh, hopefully it'll be fixed in the final rule, uh, just so it isn't as onerous and really makes it so home builders can still home build and figure out a way to a way to comply. Um, the 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 way. If, if things don't sort of come out uh, reasonable, uh, our first direct line of uh, sort of discussion is take that up to leadership and say, hey, this uh, is unworkable um, and sort of start the discussions there. And we don't mind actually, that, that, that's what we'd like to do and see if there's a positive outcome there. There's also uh, educating sort of uh, congressional critters. Uh, there's, there's nothing wrong with uh, talking to the policymakers and saying, and, and educating them uh, in terms of what potential impacts or what impacts are gonna happen to the industry and how that sort of, um, uh, uh, implementation could negatively impact innovation in the United States because that's one of the key principles that <clears throat> uh, uh, we, we, we've seen is that people would love to buy American and it, it just sort of making it more difficult for the small manufacturers is going to put a crimp in that because that's where a lot of the innovation happens. You take a look mm -hmm. at Apple. It started out of a garage. And we want to make sure that these uh, d domestic manufacturers are able to innovate and uh, aren't burdened, overburdened by regulations. So that's where the, the, the education with the policymakers comes in. Yeah. And, and I think also, that's also one of the great things about Kenji is he's, he CC'd me in some emails that, that go directly to some of the upper echelon in the FAA, especially the UAS office. Um, so that, that inroads, I mean, we're not, we're not influencing them, but we have access to them, which not a lot of people do. And understandable. I mean, they're not going to, you know, they're going to want, they're not going to want emails from 200,000 DSPs. That's just not fair for them to have to get that. Well, uh, and I do think you actually do influence them because even by just mentioning it, it may be something that they've never thought about. And then all of a sudden it comes up across and, and, you know, it's just, uh, it's something that they need to hear at least whether they take it into account or not, at least they heard it. Mm -hmm. um, now you're going to be going head to head with some pretty large companies, especially if you get on the DAC, uh, how, and these guys have been close to regulators for years. They may have a pretty large budget for lobbying and all of that. How do you compete, if, even if that's an option, against these uh, larger companies? Hopefully with the use of common sense. Um, just appealing to them, really. Um, getting, getting with them and just talking one-on-one -on -one with whoever is in front of you. Um, just saying, look, I understand your position, but you just have to be diplomatic about it. And we're not going to have, you know, we're not going to hire a DC lobbying firm, you know, and, and it, maybe it means Kenji and I go into DC during uh, the, the, whatever that week is the AVSI puts on and, um, and getting in front of people and talking to them and say, look, this, this is, this is the voice from the bottom. Um, so it's, it's going to take a lot of work and it's going to take a lot of face-to-face -face work uh, or like this, Zoom to Zoom work. Um, I, I had actually have had a Zoom meeting with one of the DAC members, uh, Fort, uh, Fort Collins mayor here, uh, Droxel. Droxel? I can't remember. But um, yeah, uh, good guy. But um, it's, that's what it's going to take is actually just, I think, individual, um, you know, getting in front of the individual people on the DAC or uh, legislators. Yep. Yeah. And the other thing, too, is coalition building, too, because mm -hmm. there's, there's folks who, uh, <coughs> excuse me, might uh, not agree on 100% of things, but there, yeah. there, there are areas of commonality and emphasizing those areas of commonality uh, on specific issues, I think it can gain some traction. And it's also the art of compromise. It's not, it's not my way to the highway because that's never productive. Uh, just, just being able to stake out a reasonable position and saying, hey, let's work together to, because I think the end goal uh, in whatever is, 
in, in the entire process is to encourage innovation, integrate uh, U UAVs into the national airspace, and to do so safely um, with all interests sort of mm -hmm. taken into account. So I think you, when you have those fundamental goals, uh, I, I think there is uh, sort of uh, room to agree. Yep. Like good compromise is everybody's happy or nobody's happy uh, with the outcome. And so I think our goal is definitely the, the former. It's like, you know, let's get a compromise that everybody's happy with and everybody can live with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I, that's uh, compromises everything. And, and we've seen this in politics for a long time. Oh yeah. That's there. There's no question there. So tell me more about the membership uh, membership fees, what is the cost for the average person if they want to help you guys uh, accomplish your mission? Go ahead, Katie. Take it away, Vic. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. We have, um, actually, I don't know the whole, uh, maybe um, Kenji can jump in when, when I'm done, but we have a student level at $5 a month and then a regular level at um, 20 a month. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yep. And then that's we have right. some other, we have a $100 a month one, um, which you were graciously enough to, uh, to be one of our first members there for that. Um, and it's, it's, it's not like public service where, hey, well, you pledge $20 a month and you get this beautiful tote bag. Um, that's not how we're going to do it. Um, and uh, it's, it's really what, you know, it's, it's those funds are going to be used to, to do things like go to the DC meeting, pay for DAC travel, that kind of stuff. Um, and, you know, do what we can do with that. And that's where the transparency comes in. But there are some other levels um, that we've worked with that we haven't come across yet anybody volunteering for but what are those Kenji I can't remember uh, we have a couple uh, sort of uh, increasing sponsorships uh, uh, sort of memberships you can take a look at our website to, mm -hmm. to get those exactly Which but is, uh, you get increasing right sort of yeah so give us the website I know Vic you had it in the background uh, dspaalliance.org so I'm going to put a link down in the in the description as well uh, I personally encourage everyone to join uh give these guys your money <laughs> open your checkbooks no uh, I'm, which we'll honestly, use wisely <laughs> on a serious note I, I do i do believe that if there are two people in this industry that can uh help us move forward you two are the guys to do this so uh I, I do mean it when Thanks, i say join and and help them uh, i think this is by far the best effort that i have seen since 2016 when i started following drones uh, a lot and getting involved with this. So uh, I, uh, I, I really hope that this is successful. I know it will be successful. And, uh, and I know you'll have a lot of work on your plate because uh, <laughs> Very soon. <laughs> yeah, we're in the infancy of, of all of this. I wanted to add one thing, Kenji, to what you said. You know, the, um, the, the FPV community is at risk with possibly with Remote ID. And this is a, a danger for our industry because they are – the first step for many people to get interested in aviation and not only just drones in aviation in general people mm -hmm. that become pilots airplane pilots i hear it all the time i started by flying you know a little foam airplane um at the ama field and we need to keep that so this is something we need to keep fighting for and make sure that that, that industry doesn't disappear because it mm -hmm. is what's going to make this industry great in the future by bringing all the people that are going to be flying the drones and and, and joining us in the future so uh, that's uh, absolutely so, yeah that's something mm -hmm. that's big to me anything else you guys want to add i don't want to take more of your time i think we've answered a lot of good questions um i just I, the only thing i want to add is we really do uh, appreciate any and all support you all have uh, have for us um it's 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 already kind of humbling to see the people who have come on board with us and it's like oh that's awesome thank you so much and the, and the support we're getting from people like you know like you um and, and it's it's neat and um we're you know, we're, we're, we're humbled by it and we're looking forward to really just doing what we can to help the industry. Mm -hmm. And from my perspective, what it, what, it, what it comes down to is really helping our community and mm -hmm. our industry grow because, uh, I mean, we all want to be successful and want to help provide the, the, the tool sets and policies to make <clears throat> it uh, uh, make it easier to be successful. And the other piece too is, of course, transparency and making sure that people know that their their money is being wisely spent. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not going to be like some other organization that, that go off on, on junkets or spend money on first class tickets. No, we don't operate that way. And we'll make sure that we're transparent and we show that. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm used to sort of uh, sleeping on couches that, that happened during, <laughs> d during the aviation rulemaking committee. Yeah. I mean, uh, we, we, 
we won't go that far, but we want well, to. Well, I don't sure. know. If you're in the D.C. Arlington area, hit us up. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I know somebody with a couch, but yeah. We, 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 I know a couple, exactly. We, we want to be good stewards of your money and make sure that it's used effectively because that's what your dues, uh, you want your dues to be mm-hmm. done with is to be used effectively. And you want to see a, a return on investment for your investment in us. Big so time. any, any uh, support you can give us is, is highly appreciated because we'll make it, make sure it gets put, gets put to good use. So thank mm-hmm. you. Well, to me, it's a cheap investment. You know, it's, uh, if it's 20 bucks a month, uh, you think about what you pay for $20 a month. It's, it's totally worth it. So let's, uh, let's schedule a, uh, a follow-up for early January so we can talk about how awesome Remote ID is. <laughs> yes, we'll do that. Awesome. We'll keep that, we'll keep that, that vibe out there. Yep. Well, gentlemen, I appreciate your time. Uh, we'll be uh, posting this on Friday after the news update. I'll be announcing all of this as well and then putting this interview at the end of the video. Awesome. But, uh, thank you for your time. And then uh, we'll be following up and, and, and see how this goes.